you know, welcome everybody. This is the April 16th uh, edition of the OpenShift Commons briefings. For those of you who don't know, the Commons is a gathering of ISVs, VARs, SIs, customers, individual developers, anybody interested in the OpenShift ecosystem who wants to contribute and be part of it can join the Commons and find out interesting topics, where we're going, where we're headed. Uh, today's briefing is about continuous development with JRebel on OpenShift. We have Adam from Zero Turnaround here. You can see him on the video, and we have Arun from uh, Red Hat. I'll hand it over to you, Adam. Thanks. I think actually Arun is, is going to be kicking us off. Um, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as Mike said, you know, uh, it is about continuous development with JRebel on OpenShift. Um, so we should be able to show you the relevance of both JRebel and OpenShift and how they work very well with each other. So with that, Adam, your time. Yeah. So uh, my name is Adam Koblenz. I'm the product marketing manager for JRebel at Zero Turnaround. Um, I you know, used to be a, a real professional developer. I actually wrote code for a living, you know, one of those kind of guys, uh, at a large investment bank in the US. And then I kind of made my way through to here where I helped bring awesome software to other developers that I wish I would have had when, when I was writing code. Um, now, Arun. Right, so I, uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I work for Red Hat. Uh, I've spent good time at Sun and then Oracle. And now at Red Hat, I run their technical marketing and developer advocacy team. Um, I love coding, you know, I, I love, I, that's sort of my key part, you know, I love coding every day. If I don't code, I can't sleep well. <laughs> so I think that's that's what keeps me alive. Uh, lots of different ways to reach out to me, Twitter, blog. I'm a compulsive blogger. i to pretty much push out two blogs a week or so. And then you can send me an email at arungupta at redhat.com. So with that, let's move on to the next slide then. So today what we're going to talk about is you, know, uh, you want to do continuous development. Now in order to do continuous development, you need tools. Uh, the tool that we recommend for JBoss technologies is JBoss Tools. Uh, so it's a kind of an intuitive name in that sense. Now, JBoss Tools is basically a set of Eclipse plugins for JBoss technology. Um, whether you want to build a mobile application using AeroGear, whether you want to do a full stack Java EE development, whether you want to use Wildfly as an application server, um, whether local or in the cloud, which is what we're going to talk about today or you want to do rules development or camel or hibernate or forge or cdi all of those tools are available as part of the jboss tools um, you can either have uh, eclipse with you and then install jboss tools in there which is a set of eclipse plugins or you can download the jboss developer studio where these tools are pre-packaged and a lot more easier for you to get that one bundle where everything is seamlessly integrated um, of course, needless to say, you know, JBoss tools provide first-class integration for OpenShift, and we'll talk about that in a second. Next slide. So, um, well, what is Wildfly? Well, Wildfly is um, uh, Red Hat's open-source Java EE 7 compliant application server. Uh, it was released in February of last year, uh, became, basically became Java EE 7 compliant. That was Wildfly 8.0. Um, 9.0 is coming later this year. In between, we have released 8.1 and 8.2. So there is a constant cadence of releases that is coming out of Red Hat. Um, and in 9.0, again, we have some really cool features coming up, like you know, graceful shutdown, where your connections are not disturbed if you're initiated the shutdown process, and um, making it a lot more modular. This is also the upstream version for JBoss EAP, which is a commercial addition. Uh, where you can get commercially supported um, for Wildfly. Now, JBoss EAP today is Java EE 6 compliant, but the EAP 7, which is coming out hopefully later this year, will be uh, Java EE 7 compliant. So you can build your application on Wildfly, deploy it, uh, but if you need commercial support, you will have to wait for EAP 7, which should be available um, in the next few months. And uh, yeah, well, wh wh why would you do go for uh, commercial support? Um, the typical reason our customers go for commercial support is, you know, you don't want to deploy anything on just pure open source, you know, grab it from uh, off the shelf and then deploy on it. Um, you want a company to back it up uh, specifically with, you know, uh, if there's an issue with your application or your application server setup. 
security patches, updates. We do constantly monitor and provide updates on that. So as a commercial support, those are some of the biggest benefits you, that you get as part of the EAP, right? Yeah, that, that's actually one of the reasons that I really like using Wildfly is that I know that when I want to put my application into production, I I can reliably you know uh, deploy it on on a supported version of the same kind of platform. You know what we do with something like Tomcat or something. You know you're kind of hoping that that things are going to work out in production and hope that you can find you know third party support and it's it's, it's really a mess. And I think one of the yeah that, that, that's a very relevant point because one of the key parts of this is the code base between Wildfly and EAP is pretty much same. And when I say pretty much, I really mean 99.9% .9 same. At a given point of time, we say, okay, you know what, Wildfly is pretty mature. It's got the features, it's got the production features that we want. We take it and we say, okay, now let's cut it into a JBoss EAP. We run some additional tests, some database certifications, JDK certifications, and then we put it out for production release. So what that means is, unlike you know, um, WebLogic or WebSphere, which are purely closed source application servers, here you can continuously evolve your application with Wildfly and whenever EAP is ready, so just seamlessly switch over to EAP for commercial uh, um, deployment. Next slide. So we talked about uh, JBoss tools, which is your development environment. Then we talk about Wildfly, which is your you know, application server. Uh, what is OpenShift? Right? OpenShift is open source PaaS platform from Red Hat. And it comes in three different flavors. Uh, there is a uh, origin which is sort of the very classical red hat way where everything is done out in the open source all the features every functionality for openshift is contributed in origin it's basically a github project so you know um, you check out the workspace you can build that entire openshift on your machine by yourself so that's the first one the second one is online which you see on the far left here um, online is the public pass version so uh, anybody could go to openshift.com sign up for an account free, um, no credit card required. Um, once you sign up for an account, today what you get is three um, gears. And gear is an OpenShift specific terminology, but essentially each gear is a half a gig of RAM and one gig of disk space. Um, and so you can easily create your multi-tier application or at least three-tier application very easily over there on three different gears, essentially. And then we have the private cloud version of it, which is the OpenShift Enterprise, where you can say, hey, this is my private pass. I have my data center running. And in my data center, instead of creating my own environment, own mechanism to manage that data center, I'm going to just install OpenShift Enterprise over there. And on that OpenShift Enterprise, um, I, I'm going to install my custom application servers, which we call them as cartridges. Um, so you can install your cartridges and run, run with it. Um, it really allows you to standardize your operating environment um, and uh, simplifies the entire operational um, nature of it. Now that's, in terms of OpenShift online and enterprise, today we are at V2. Uh, moving forward this year, the plan is to release V3, which is gonna be powered by Docker and Kubernetes. Now I don't want to go into the details of Docker and Kubernetes per se right now, but essentially what that gives you is, you know, Docker is a standard format for containers you know, how you can run your application in containers or software containers very easily. And Kubernetes is a project that is created by Google and heavily contributed by Red Hat, which allows you to do Docker container orchestration. Um, so essentially, you can leverage all the benefits of Docker and Kubernetes when V3 is available later this year. Yeah, and all it's right. also, I think, really cool to point out that like even the, the online public PaaS version of OpenShift with just like the trial account, it's actually pretty powerful, and like you, you can actually play around with it and get a, get a real good sense for what you're doing. Um, and like Arun said, we're not necessarily going to talk about Docker and Kubernetes in in this talk, but everything that that we're showing you should work in Docker in the future when when V3 rolls out as well. Right. Yeah. The, the way I like to say that is, you know, uh, OpenShift um, or, uh, online is not a crippleware as right. other companies. Say. You know what? They they give you an account and then the time bombs after a few months or they charge, start charging you money. Right. This account stays with you. We do hibernate applications if you're not using it. And that's for the right reason. You know, If you're not using an application or if the application is not being used by anybody else, we just hibernate it, but you know, you just access the application and then it kind of comes back live again. So I think, uh, I think it's a pretty compelling offering. Yeah, it's pretty cool. 
So right. I guess that brings us to, to me. So um, like, like I said before, I work for uh, Zero Turnaround, and we make uh, Jarable and Xrebel, um, which are you know, revolutionary tools for developing quality software faster. Um, now, the whole point of like what I'm going to show you today and what Arun and I are talking about today is basically how you can make the cloud development experience way, um, way less painful, right? Because there are tons of benefits to why you should write code in the cloud versus locally, or why writing code in the cloud actually is, is a beneficial experience. But it is kind of painful because no matter how great the tooling is, there's still extra tooling, right? And so we're going to show you how using Jarable we can kind of uh, help help make that less painful. So um, Jarable is uh, it's a JVM plugin. It's a developer productivity tool, right? Uh, basically, the whole idea is that it lets you stop redeploying your application or and restarting your application server. You can reload your code changes instantly without having to stop the application. Um, so what you'll see later on in, in this briefing is I'm going to make code changes to the application while it's running an OpenShift locally on my JBoss Dev Studio or Eclipse or IntelliJ. And then, um, you know, what happens is it's, you, you make your code change and we'll actually load the new version in for you. Uh, right now we have 65,000 happy users. This is a, a stat that I'm really, really impressed by myself. And I think that it's, it's pretty cool. We have such a, a large, you know, user base. Now you may be asking, uh, why do I have a bacon wrap Ferrari? And this is something that came out of uh, when I was talking with some of our uh, some of our uh, coworkers a few years ago. We're like, you know, who doesn't like Ferraris, and what would be better than a Ferrari? And then someone else. This is when Parks and Recreation was first starting, and they're like, oh well, let's wrap it in bacon. So a bacon wrap Ferrari. Who wouldn't want a bacon wrap Ferrari? Uh, <laughs> So, um, like I said before, uh, what is Jarable? It lets you reload coaches instantly. So you may be thinking that, like, you know, the JVM already has something like this. It's called HotSwap. But unlike HotSwap, Jarable doesn't require you to be in debug, in debug mode. It also supports, you know, changing your class schemas, adding new methods and fields, and we support Java class file changes, resource file changes, and we also have integration written for over 90 frameworks and their, their configurations. So that means you can change things like your Hibernate, you know, JPA, which I'll actually show you, you know, Java EE supported, uh, Spring, you know, if, if, if you use that, um, you'll be able to seamlessly make changes to your application, not have to worry about the tooling involved, whether it's local or or in, in some cloud provider like, like OpenShift or Docker in the future. Um, and you can just kind of stay focused on actually doing your work. So what we find is that on average, developers spend about one full work month per year waiting for redeploys of their app, their app server. And that's everything, you know, that's, that's based on data that goes everywhere from people who have five to 15 second, you know, jetty, you know, tiny single servlet apps all the way up to people who have, you know, millions of lines of code in their full featured Java E enterprise applications, right? And with Jarable, it doesn't really matter because you just make your code changes, hit save, Refresh and, and and you can view them. And the benefits here, are you can go home on time, right? You don't and without having to cut your feature scope. Like I said, I used to work in a large investment bank, and so that kind of means that I'm pretty familiar with like large enterprise applications. Um, and this was you know G, Java EE five at the time, uh, but still, you know, as we got closer and closer to the end of a sprint, I'd have to work longer and longer hours. You know, my wife would want to know when I'm going to come when I'm coming home, um, and if I had a tool like Jarable, it would have been fantastic, you know, because I actually had a 16-minute redeploy on one of my applications. So every time that I made a code change that had a typo in it, I wasted a half hour of my life trying to verify that the code did what I wanted to do. Uh, and with Jarable, you know, you can change anything. No matter how complex your application is, as far as we're concerned, it's still Java, it's still bytecode, and we're going to do the ultra-low-level engineering work to make that happen. And we actually do have uh, case studies and surveys on our site that back up the, our, the, the, um, the claim that Jarable actually can increase team velocity by up to 40%. So that means you're getting 40% so more work it done. May look like, it may look like black magic, but I think the key part that you're highlighting here is just using regular standard byte code manipulation to make sure your changes are visible instantly. Yeah, I mean, yes, it is using, so the average Java developer never usually touches byte code. But the guys that we have, you know, at Zero Turnaround are like bytecode ninjas. Like they, you know, 
ultra low level JVM hackers who can make a wonderful technology happen, um, you know, and bring it to anyone who does Java development. Um, so right. uh, here's a quick comparison between Jarable and HotSwap. Um, like I said, HotSwap method bodies, Jarable everything else. We actually released Jarable 6 in November of last year. And I'm just kind of showing you some of the new stuff. Like here, now we can do uh, hierarchy stuff as well. So replacing superclasses, uh, implementing a new interfaces, uh, initializing new instance fields. So for example, if you had like a, a instance, like a person class with uh, a field for first name, and you wanted to add a new field for last name, um, you know, without that last uh, feature, that meant that your existing instances would have this null field or this, this un, uninitialized field that would cause you to have problems if you didn't have like tons of security checking in your application. So uh, what's really important for um, you know any tool, any developer tool, is does it support your platform and your your tech stack? So Jarable supports almost everything from IDEs. We have Eclipse and all the Eclipse-based IDEs, and that also includes JBoss Dev Studio, uh, IntelliJ, and NetBeans if you are using those. We can hook in with Maven, Ant, or Gradle. As far as application servers, we have JBoss EAP and Wildfly. We also have Tomcat, you know, Wild, um, WebLogic, WebSphere, Glassfish. Those are all supported. As far as frameworks, like I said, we have over 90 that we have integration for. So that's Java EE uh, and all of the sub specs. We have, you know, Spring, Hibernate, um, JBoss Seam is one of our one of our, one of our supported frameworks, for example. Wicket, if you if you use that, we have some people, some real hardcore Wicket users who are you know loyal users of Jarable as well. <clears throat> so before we get started in like showing you what Jarable can actually do, let's quickly touch on how to how do you get it. So you can install Jarable from uh, the Eclipse Marketplace or the update site. It's also available for NetBeans and IntelliJ in their plugin directories, and then it's also available as a zip file. So if you want to go to our website, if you don't use an IDE or if you have some very non-standard IDE system, go to the download zip file off our website. The Java agent's right there. It's super easy to install. So now I'm going to just quickly jump out of the uh, slides, and I'll show you how to actually install Jarable and configure it and just look around and see what we have here. So here I've got my JBoss Dev Studio. It's a very you know, standard Eclipse JBoss dev tools are installed. Everyone's you know, familiar with this, I hope. And then you can go to the Eclipse Marketplace if you were in a normal Eclipse. Since I'm not in normal Eclipse, I would have to go to uh, install new software or JBoss Central. And both of those have the option for installing Jarable. If I go to install new software, um, you, can install, you can add the update site. Um, Hopefully that's not too taxing on my clips right now with my video and everything going, but um, the update site's right here, and you would see um, you'd pick Jarable for Eclipse 3.3 plus and derivatives because JBoss Dev Studio is based on uh, I think this is is this based on Luna, Arun? Yeah, you're I think you're muted. Sorry, I think you're muted. <laughs> Funny, yeah, I was muted. So yeah, JBoss Developer Studio is uh, something that we release on an uh, annual cadence. Uh, JBoss Tools plugins, we make sure they always work with the latest release of Eclipse. Okay, great. And so I think this version is based on either Lunar or Kepler. So it should be a very modern version of Eclipse, and you shouldn't have any, there should be no issues with, uh, with things being out of date. Uh, personally, I've been using this for the last couple of weeks. And I found it to be pretty, uh, pretty intuitive. The tools make sense, and there's some real niceties there as well. Um, and if you're using uh, NetBeans or IntelliJ, you would go to their plugin directories and install it there. Um, with Eclipse and the Eclipse-based IDEs, you have your activation and your config center. Um, in the configuration center, that's where you enable Jarable for your local app servers and also any of the extra configuration options that you want to um, use. So let's see if this is going to load. Yeah, right now my, my processor is pegged with all this video and everything. So let's see how this goes. Yeah, all right. Here we go. Oh, okay. All right, well, so this is rendering weird, but that's fine. The idea is that you basically have uh, your local stuff is installed right here. 
And if you have an uh, app server that you want to enable Jaribel on locally, you just check the checkbox. Um, if you're, I do this, no, okay, that's fine. Um, you can also enable Jaribel for your projects, but I'll show you how to do this separately in the context menus. And you can enable and disable for your debug stuff under here in your logging. So let's just go back to normal JBoss. Okay, this is fine. So um, go back to Keynote. Okay, so the question is like, yeah, how does it work? So Jaribel works uh, local, which means the app server installed in the same, uh, on the same machine as the IDE, either running in the IDE or from the command line. Uh, remote is uh, the JVM or the app server is on a different machine than the IDE. And the last one is cloud. So like OpenShift would be a great, uh, especially what we're going to show you for the cloud offering here. You make your code changes, compile the class, and then use the new code. Compiling the class is usually handled for you by your IDE. So for example, JBoss Dev Studio and the Eclipse-based IDEs, build automatically is enabled, you hit save, and the class gets generated. And the way this works is with workspace mapping. So static content served from the workspace. Class path resources loaded into the JVM in memory by, by Jarrell. And we're going to see how this works, and it's actually really cool in, in a few minutes. So the architecture, so that it's clear how everything actually fits together, because right now this is, I'm sure, kind of, uh, kind of generalized. So the idea is that the JVM has Java options and you get either the Java agent or the agent path with a native library. If you're using the remote function, then you'd have to add a separate Java option as well to actually enable remoting. In the application, there are two pieces, and both of them are generated for you by the uh, IDE plugins. There's the rebel.xml, which maps out the class path and static resources, and the optional rebel, rebel remote XML which contains your crypto keys and remote IDs if appropriate to enable the plugin to correctly uh, do the remoting to the, um, to the cloud or to the remote VM. In the IDE, you have the Jarable plugin and that generates everything for you. So I think that we've done enough slideware now and I think now it's time to move on to uh, the functional portion of, uh, of the demo. Um, uh, Adam, there's a question in there uh, where they're saying, is there a plugin for Sublime Text? Uh, so what you would use there, um, well, we, we actually have people who do this. We have people who use like uh, Emacs, for example, or Vim and, and Jarable, and you basically just need to um, issue the compile and command yourself. So you can use whatever you want to write your Java files, and then you just need to use either Ant or Maven or Gradle to compile the incremental classes. Um, unfortunately, in order to use OpenShift or any of our remote or cloud functionality, you do need an actual IDE plugin. Because um, the way that this works is Jarable will actually piggyback on the servlet context of the remote machine and actually send the files for you to the remote machine and then do the, the class reloading. So we need something to hook into to actually send the files over HTTP to the, to the machine. That's why you actually need a real plugin. Um, I hope that answers the question, and I'm sorry if they're trying to use Sublime Text uh, and, and, and OpenShift at the same time for, for Jarable. Um, but I promise but I you, that, 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 that was great. Sublime Text and the uh, Emacs audience is pretty hacky, so they should be able to hack something together. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, you can do something. I'm sure it's fine. I mean, worst case, uh, this won't work with OpenShift, but if you are using a... Um, a, a remote VM, for example, like VMware or, or, or Docker container or something, you actually could use, you could hack together something with rsync or something, um, and, and that, would, that would also work. We have customers who do that. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, uh, wrong window, get this guy, get the right one. Yeah, all right. So what I have here is I have my OpenShift account. So you can actually use my application if you want to, I guess. Uh, but I have the Wildfly uh, app server 8.2 final cartridge, along with uh, the Jarable cartridge, which was originally written by someone at Red Hat, and I, I've recently taken ownership for a little bit, so I can update it, and then we'll figure that out later. But um, you can follow along with the instructions at this uh, blog post. It's a little out of date, but it's more or less what you want to do. 
and it shows you how to use OpenShift and get Jarable installed with it. You basically just have to add the cartridge uh, and then enable the remoting in the uh, IDE plugin. So I've done that and I have this uh, kind of simple Java EE7 application. Uh, I think this one is, uh, okay, so this is not based on, on Arun's sample from before, but I actually have one of Arun's hands-on labs that, we, uh, that we've done before with OpenShift. This is actually a simple Java EE7 application. I've got um, uh, web servlets, I have JPA, and I also have CDI. Um, and so this is running on Wildfly 8.2. As you can see, I have my rebel.xml, which was generated for me. And I also have my rebel remote XML, which contains my, my crypto keys, because I don't want to send my code over the wire unencrypted in case someone is sniffing for some, you know, somehow, right? So um, we have a very simple servlet. I have this test servlet that I've added. If I go to my Chrome, I see I have this test servlet. I'm doing some absolute, like, please never do this in a real application, but <laughs> I'm injecting my, my, con, my, my entity manager into the servlet just because it's a, a way for me to show you how these things work without having to spend too much time talking about all the extra stuff you know, with best practices in Java EE. I just want to show you something functional that works really cool. So please don't do this ever. But uh, <laughs> just to show you the kinds of stuff, like if I want to make really simple code changes, Right. right now, I assure you, this is running on OpenShift. This is not a local application. You can see that it's running on rhcloud.com uh, with my domain and my application. And I can go in my JBoss Dev Studio. I'm trying to figure out where to put you, Arun. <laughs> okay. So uh, I can, you know, just make uh, small changes. Like here, I'm going to say just text change Arun. So hit save, and you see that. Um, I just got this message from the Jarable remoting saying that my uploaded my resource and transaction was committed, right? So the class file got uploaded into OpenShift, and I can just hit refresh, and it works, right? So what 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 my application is doing is when I hit uh, the servlet with a GET request, it just generates a random number and creates a new attendee with uh, that number and whatever name I'm just passing in. So here's a rune. Here's another a rune. A rune's coming to my webinar a lot. He's a very vocal attendee. Uh, so, you know, what's kind of cool is I, you know, even though that is a really, really simple change, just normal, you know, method body change, um, you can't do that in, you know, these these cloud solutions because you have to commit the. So with OpenShift, you have to commit the code to the Git repository, and then it uh, it bounces Wildfly, which is actually a really cool way to handle things, like you know, hooking in with, with with the Git triggers, but you know, maybe you don't, maybe you're not doing that much stuff and you just want to do a quick change. So that's fine. But let's say you want to do something a little bit more complex. Like let's say we want to add a new servlet. So I've got this, this hello servlet right here. So I'm just going to go to um, hello servlet instead of test servlet. Okay. And that works. So right now the servlet works. And so what I can do is I'm just going to copy it. I'm just going to create a copy of it and change the uh, the output text and also change the mapping. So this is going to be Adam servlet. So in Adam servlet, we see it already actually sent the file because it saw that the file that there's a new class file, so it already saved it and already sent it. I'm going to give it a new mapping, Adam servlet, right? I'm going to say this is cool, right? So now I hit save. My class file got generated by JBoss Dev Studio. It, it built the .class. Jarable remoting, uh, remoting cloud functionality kicked in. The class file got updated on the, on the OpenShift <clears throat> instance. And now I can go to Adam Servlet. And that worked. So uh, you know, help me understand, you know, in this yeah. case, it's not the entire war file that is being redeployed. It's nope. just that one class file that is uploaded. We are we are not even yeah yeah exactly so it's just just the change to dot class files or resources get sent at all so even if you have like a so you're taking like slow network connections out of the equation you're not you're not uploading all your resources again if you have a a, a ear or a wire that has tons of pictures you're not you're not sending that again you're only sending the dot class file that actually got changed 
to a cached folder or a caching folder on the remote machine or VM or, or cloud environment. And then Jarable kicks in and reloads just that piece that was actually changed. So and that would work actually, for all the standard Java E components, whether it's a servlet, whether it's a JAXRS resource, whether it's a JPA and all those exactly. components. Yeah, so here, like let's, right now, let's just add a new, a new JPA entity and then we'll start using it. Okay, so let's make a, do, do, do. right now I have an attendee, I have a dev user and a normal user. Let's copy one of them again, just because in interest of, of time savings. I'm gonna copy my dev user, right? So I'm gonna duplicate the class and I'm gonna change this to a you know, coffee drinker, right? Because devs are coffee drinkers, let's be honest. <laughs> so I'll go to my coffee drinker class. We're gonna change our named queries. So I'll say find all drinker or find all coffee drinkers, right? We'll say find C from coffee drinker C. Okay. And now we can go and make sure that all this stuff's right. We're gonna change the two string. Okay. You may want to change that um, uppercase C to lowercase C in the name query. Uh, yep. Yeah. Good call. Here we go. No, I want, no, no. This C is okay, but at the end. Ah, yes. There we go. Just so I had too much coffee today. <laughs> so um, now we're all set, right? So we have this new JPA entity. We have it has an ID and a string. And does it have a name? No. Here, I'll give it a name too. Right. Okay. Let's add a new. Uh, let's add a new constructor that takes in a string as well. Okay. And if this one doesn't get set, then we'll just do this. That name equals default. Okay. And we'll do a getter and setter for it. And then I'm just going to hit generate for. See, because you can use, you know, the benefit of an ID is that you can generate this stuff if you want to. So, there's and setters, name, and we're okay. Okay, so get and set name. Okay. Move you again, Arun. Okay. So, this should be good. We have a getter and setter for the name. We added our new constructor. We have our new field. This is a new JPA entity, you know, just for fun. Change that too to comment. We want to keep our comments up to date as well. Hit save. So we see that we actually sent the new file, so it's already there. And now if we want to, we can go back to our servlet and change what we were doing to use this new, uh, this new type. So we're gonna use our new entity. So without having to do anything, which it's all just going to work. So we're going to do find all coffee drinkers for our name query. Change our class. Coffee drinkers. There's a typo in there. Yep. Okay. And typo here too. Okay. See, don't make your class names too too complicated. There we go. No, that, that, that's, that's when you use auto code completion. Yeah, that's yeah. true. All right. So this is all now using the right type. And now I can go to my, my persisting as well. And I'm going to change my persistence to persist a new coffee drinker. And then give it the name Arun still. And now I should be able to hit save. There's no compilation errors. The class got uh, got compiled and uploaded. Now if I go back to my servlet, go back again. Now I have a coffee drinkers. So what we see here is that using Jarable, I was able to add a new JPA entity. I was able to hook that into the existing persistence manager um, in my servlet, and I was able to use it without having to rebuild the application. I didn't have to restart my, my OpenShift gear. I didn't even have to, you know, I didn't lose any of the state in my application. Like if I go back, um, my, my other users are all still there, which is, like this is just so powerful because now it gives you the flexibility to write code against a cloud app, a cloud platform without having to sacrifice any of your, your time or sanity to do that. Yeah, so this, this, this is, is, one of the implementation details that might be relevant is that if you create per brand new persistence.xml, 
you know, that won't work because that time, you know, JRable does not know how to initiate database connection. But once the database connection is established, you have redeployed the WAR file, then any number of entities can be easily added. Right, or modified or anything, and, and that, that'll all it'll all work just the way you expect it to. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think this is awesome. This is Grant, by the way, and, you know, it's a, a game changer for the OpenShift community who are Java developers, because today, we you know, we bounce the server every time you deploy, but we also support hot deployment, um, which can take, you know, 45 seconds to two minutes, which makes OpenShift not really a viable platform to actually do development on uh, in a cloud-based infrastructure. And so using the JRebel plugin makes an awesome experience and you can, you know, use OpenShift cloud deployments for the entire development through production lifecycle, which is great. Yeah, and, and that's that's exactly I mean, that's exactly what I love to hear. Whenever I show, whenever I show think about this, think about this, right? The people who the people like who like cloud platform developers, developers, developers to use that because, because the, experience, the experience, like the idea is that if you write code right in a cloud code, platform, platform, you can hit you know real services in development and not have to mock everything out and hope it works. Now, the problem is that how do you how do you uh, you know, give people the experience that they need in order to actually functionally write applications, right? And not have the the downtime associated with actually transferring your application all the way to a cloud instance. Like, so there's actually a survey or actually a study that, that Microsoft did. I saw this in the New York Times recently. Um, what they found was that the average email, right? Even one email, like getting an email and reading it, takes you about nine minutes to being produ as productive as you were before, right? And that, that's only just reading an email. Imagine having a two minute, a two to five to 10 or however long minute redeploy of your application, right? So it's actually like the, the downtime is pretty, pretty aggressive in terms of the drain on, on, your, on your productivity. Um, I have one more quick cool thing to show in this and that's I'm gonna, attempt to do some CDI shenanigans. Uh, so I have, I think, CDI test at JSF. Let's see if this works. I was playing around with this earlier, and I didn't, I didn't clean this off before I did it, but, so here's a, uh, here, here we go. So here I'm using JSF and CDI, and um, if I go to my code, let me just close some of these things, because they're kind of in the way right now. Okay, so I have, um, this test bean, the name test bean, right? And this is getting a, a bean injected into it, and this is what's actually feeding that um, that JSF file. So let me open that file up, and you can see what, we're, what I'm doing. Okay, so test bean test two right there. So it's getting the uh, the value and putting it into the output text of the JSF page. And so what I can do while this is all still running, first off, I can change this to two if I or to two if I want. Right, hit save, and you see the class got, got pushed. Go back here, hit refresh, and now it says two. So that worked. And we can also change which beans are getting injected. So let's say I want to swap this over to CDI bean test two. Okay. I can go back to my test, change this to two. Hit save. Now hit refresh again. We have test two which I spelled wrong, but still, the idea is that it worked. <laughs> um, I think the, the, the cool part is Jirable automatically identifies which components, which files, which classes have changed, and it sends only those classes to the um, um, deployment. And I just fixed the typo, which did not take me any time because I have Jirable, as opposed to having yeah. to bounce, bounce stuff. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think, I think cool. Grant really put it very nicely because Typically, the pain point for me is, you know, every, I mean, by default, OpenShift behavior is you make a change, you do a Git push, you know, it does the whole shebang, you know, you are going out for a coffee and you're coming back. It almost feels like a web sphere application server restart. Um, but with this, you know, the changes are instant. So you are actually really doing continuous development, you know, with this. And then, you know, when your stuff is ready, then you say, oh, by the way, now let's do the default behavior where you restart the cartridge and the whole thing. Right, exactly. And so what the way that, okay, so you may be asking like realistically how long does it take you to actually be productive with this? 
And the idea is that you you have your cartridge with Wildfly, you have your cartridge, the Jarable cartridge embedded into it. You just enable Jarable on, on your application. And then you just add the URL that you actually deploy to in the this remoting, this right here, this deployment URLs, and that's it. Right? Like the, the, there's no big sysop type experiment going on with you know screwing around with stuff. It just kind of works. Um, so one of the questions in the chat is, what app servers does the JRebel cartridge support today? We know Wildfly, EAP, those both are supported. Right. So um, JRebel's remoting functionality, or JRebel like actually you know works with you know Wild, WebLogic, WebSphere, Tomcat, Tommy, um, you know clearly all the JBoss stuff, the whole WebSphere family, Liberty for example. So the idea is that you know you can be you know, you don't have to change your tech stack. Whatever you are using now will work. Obviously, you know, we're advocating that you use, you know, a more of a cloud type platform with this. But, you know, the idea is you can you can keep. Uh, yeah, actually, this it should. Um, it should work. Adding the uh, Liberty server with OpenShift should work. Um, Grant. So the idea is that uh, since Liberty works, it should. Um, William, I, I guess my uh, real question, and, and I haven't actually looked at the insides mm -hmm. of the J Rebel cartridge, if it's mm -hmm. like hard coded to work with specific app servers, or if it, uh, if I do lay down the uh, Liberty cartridge on OpenShift. Yeah. So the way that I, the way that we did it, I don't know why I'm showing it to you like this. I can just show it to you on my on my terminal, but um, <laughs> uh, we're just exploring the Java option. So anything anything that reads Java ops normally should work. <clears throat> awesome. Um, Thanks. And then we have the OpenShift Jarable Dir, and these these things all get set up during during the setup section. Nothing here should be like so. Basically, we have the normal Java ops. We also have the Catalina ops built in as well. So if you're using Tomcat, for example, that that'll get picked up. Um, so yeah, as long as things are using normal standard Java ops or Catalina ops, it should work. Right. I think uh, we also showed like a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. not just OpenShift, but this would all work very well with Docker already. So when right. OpenShift V3 is launched later this year, you now it'll continue to evolve and you know make it a more seamless experience in that line as well. Right. So, but for right now, if you're using Docker, you would need to change the Docker. You have to write a Docker recipe that basically does the same thing that the cartridge is doing in OpenShift. Which is copy the, the the Java agent and the, or the native agent over to the to the Docker instance and then add the Java options there as well. Um, but that all should be fine. And as Arun says, we, we did that previously with Docker with great success. Uh, I think we may have a few slides left. Uh, just the last one. So if you want, um, we can talk more about some stuff. I can show you uh, some more code changes. Arun, did I did I miss anything this time? No, I think uh, we we covered pretty much everything that we wanted to do. You know, so we talked about how you can use um, JBoss Developer Studio or JBoss tools. Um, we we didn't talk about particularly local use case, which is not relevant for this audience. But you can do you can get all the benefits that we showed today in a local Wildfly or EAP instance as well on yep. the network or on the cloud. Um, and then I think, um, as people are saying in the chat window as well, I think this is really a game, ch game changer where it will expedite your overall development cycle where you don't have to wait for a few seconds or maybe a minute as also to right. get your application deployed. Right. Actually, so one of the things I, I, I talk to a lot, of, a lot of developers, I talk to them, I talked about, you know, I'm sure you talk, you, you as well, over and talk to a lot of developers, but um, when I show them OpenShift or I show them, you know, other, some other cloud platform, and I and like yeah, it's really cool, but you know such and such like Red Hat or some other company, the devs aren't going to use this. I mean, come on, like you know the 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 it, it, the, the tools are it, it's it's painful to to do this. And like it's great for for staging or production or whatever, but like for an actual like development, I'm not going to use it. And then I show them Jarable, and they're like, oh, well now this is actually a development platform. I can actually use this now, <laughs> you know. This is you know because I and I'm not knocking the Red Hat you know OpenShift tools. Because OpenShift tools are actually pretty good. It's just an issue of, you know, if if you have the option of a teleporter, but there's a really fast car, the fast car is still a pretty cool car. It's still pretty fast, but you could have a teleporter. 
and so that's that's kind of like it's kind of where like I'm not knocking the tools. I'm just saying that nothing nothing is better, right? Yeah, this is this is Mike. I, I get to talk to a lot of our um, enterprise users, and one of the things they try to do is chase all the efficiencies. And, and you you kind of think, right. well, you know, J Rebel is very useful even outside of this this conversation. But exactly. why why is it so why is it so attractive to a PaaS conversation? And it, it's because PaaS is is the organization sitting down and sort of trying to find inefficiencies in the system. And if you've agreed to do that, then you have you should agree to go down all the way to the developer when he first touches the code and invest at that level too. And that's why JRebel comes up a lot in our deployments because it brings that opportunity, that investment opportunity to really clean up how you're working with your code. Another big issue that we run up against is, um, uh, you know, executive staff is always trying to get developers off their laptops because laptops <laughs> are just yeah. expensive and their security risks and all sorts of fun stuff. But developers never want to give them up because they want that fastest transaction possible. They want to do unit testing there. And uh, we find JRebel really allows them to, to sort of give up their laptops finally, and that's a, that's a huge benefit. Yeah, I used to have uh, – I used to – so back, back when I worked at the bank, I had – like a ten and a half pound thing, like a you know, huge ThinkPad, um, and you know I'd go home and I'd have like a desktop that was you know way more powerful, or I'd have a netbook, and I'm like well, you know what am I really doing on on the ThinkPad that I can't do on the netbook? And really it came down to running an actual app server, right? Like 